Now we're going to focus on on uh, specifically the radio frequency identification. So if I go back to what do I have and what do I ha where is it located, and I think about apparel, or I think about electronics or other categories, um, algorithms. Matt Pfeiffer, I'm going to put you back on the spot. How well would an algorithm do to be able to tell me how many of these green shirts right here? Uh, I have available for a customer and is it on the shelf or is it not on the shelf? Would an algorithm do a pretty good job of that? And seem like it'd be very helpful. You don't think it would be? I don't think it would be, would it? And why you're right. You're hundred percent right. Why wouldn't it not be? It'd be easier just to look and see. That's true. The other thing is the amount of, uh, we call them high turn items. Algorithms work really, really well with Tide detergent and bounty paper towels and things that turn real high. We might only sell this shirt every couple of weeks. So I can't tell if it's on the shelf or it's just not selling, right? A store audit would work if somebody went through here and scanned all this stuff, but it would be extremely expensive. And what about a shelf scanning robot? Myron, a shelf scanning robot. If we had a shelf scanning robot that just had a camera on it, how good of a job could it actually do to actually tell me what I have and where it's located? My mouse was competing with yours for my mute button. Um, you know, I think shelf scanning robots would have a big challenge in this because you've got a style size color combination mm -hmm. and they can identify the shirt by location, the color, but not the size. And so right. the big challenge is getting into that child relationship on skew detail uh, is a challenge for computer vision type functions, whether it's fixed or a shelf scanning robot. Yep, 100%, 100%. So we have a technology that we're gonna be talking about today we call radio frequency identification. Uh, very briefly how it works, and then I'm going to turn it over to Dean Frew because he's the expert in this field along with Randy and others. But we're going to have Dean kind of talk about some of the business use cases of why people do it. But it basically involves putting a tag, an RFID tag, on every item in the physical store. We'll talk about how that works here in a bit, but, but for right now, just know that the tag is there. Uh, we'll have a radio frequency uh, a scanner wake up that tag and send identification information to the scanner, and then we will pass it over to actually update the inventory. This is sort of an example of how it works in a traditional scanner. You'll scan every particular barcode. It is very time consuming. It's very laborious. If they get halfway through, they get interrupted, they, they lose their spot. And this is an example of how RFID works, okay? So with that, I'm going to uh, I'm going to turn it over and, and just as a quick side load, uh, we got two industry experts that unfortunately had uh, conflicts today. Uh, Dr. Senthal unfortunately lost his father-in-law, so he had to take an emergency family trip uh, back to India to uh, to spend some time with his family, and then Justin Smith spent four days doing 15, I think, presentations. So he's flying back with his family today uh, to be with his family today. But these guys are both with the RFID Lab at Univer uh, Auburn University. I almost said University of Auburn. Um, Auburn University, they are subject matter experts. I have their LinkedIn profiles there. So if you have any follow-up questions, uh, please uh, contact them with anything you might have RFID. Dean Frew is a good friend and he is the Chief Technology Officer and Senior Vice President of RFID Solutions for SML Group and Limited. Uh, you'll see his QR code here. Um, Dean, I wanna just kind of turn it over to you. We sort of just gave you a, dip, a bit of an example of apparel. You've been doing this for a long time. Just give us kind of your top line thoughts on why RFID, what is the business case? What are you seeing in the industry? Is it, it, was, is it growing? Is it shrinking? Just your perspective of what's going on in the industry when it comes to RFID. Sure, thanks, Mike. Um, you know, clearly, you know, we a lot of us started in this industry back in 2003, 2002, 2003, 2004. And um, as, as Myron mentioned, there's a big difference between a can of green beans or a box of Tide than there is style size color on t-shirts and so on. So, you know, in um, we saw a big pivot in the late 2000s to looking at item level. And I think that's the biggest development and the transformational thing that's going on is we're moving from a skew level world to an item level world. And um, specifically in apparel, footwear, home goods, uh, electronics, 
uh, sporting goods, fragrance and cosmetics, as an example. And so um, what's what's most interesting is what we saw coming out of COVID. I mean, we could go back five, six years and talk about what happened, but really the acceleration of the use of the technology after COVID, I, I draw the analogy to people who have looked at a swimming pool, but not jumped in and not had to learn how to swim. And in COVID, almost every retailer was thrown into the pool, whether they knew how to swim or not. And that pool had to do with, with using their stores as inventory warehouses for fulfillment. And, um, and so what we're seeing now is such a huge uh, uptake in retailers who were looking at people swimming and actually now having to swim. And, um, you know, the business cases all are fundamental. I wish I could say there was some magical algorithm here, but there's not. It's about you don't know what you have. You're at that 65, 70 percent or lower, as you mentioned, Mike. And now you get up to 95, 98, 99 percent by being able to do frequent stock counts. And um, and then from there, there's a whole cascading set of benefits. Um, things like you just increase sales because availability is up. You decrease your inventory because now you know what you have and what you don't need. You you move to a pull model from the store instead of a push model from the DC. Um, you're able to, you know, the you, you mentioned the, you know, as Myron mentioned about the customer service side of thing and the trust that the consumers have when they're when you tell them that you're going to have something and you don't. And so the whole cancel rates. We've got customers that are currently operating their BOPIS with as high as 50 to 60% cancel rates before RFID and watching that drop to less than 10% with the technology. Um, you know, I, th I think we're seeing um, a growing set of customers that are looking at changing the operations of their store now that they have this technology. And so it's almost like it is a journey the, the, what we see at least is this journey. They start off with, I just want to do stock count receiving, moves, things like that, maybe supply chain. And now they're moving into running their store off of their item level system. And I think the benefits that they're getting out of that in the form of profit and reduced cost, cost both labor and material, um, is significant. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to kind of loop back to a chat uh, that David Hunter made, which was near real-time inventory is paramount for today's retailers for store operations and omni-selling. I agree with that. And is RFID a potential solution for making that happen? Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, clearly we would all like to move toward a world where it was real-time and accurate. The reality is the SKU level systems, our experience is the SKU level systems that sit above these item level systems can't respond that fast enough, that fast anyway, mm -hmm. or there's not labor to go off and to respond. If I knew, for example, that a slot was open where I had, was missing a medium blue t-shirt, I probably don't have the labor anymore to be able to service that immediately. And so I have to do things in a way where I'm, I'm gathering up that information and executing that that replenishment is, is an example in ways that match up with my labor footprint. Hmm. Um, and so uh, it, well, at least the experience, we, we've got customers that are getting daily um, inventory snapshots that are accurate. And we've got others that are doing monthly. And the difference between them is that their existing ERP systems can't respond fast enough to do it daily anyway. Okay. Even if they did that, they can't drive, they can't drive pulls effectively. So um, that's a piece of it. So if I get to a point where I, I am actually, the example that I showed with Target, they're, they're actually confident enough to say, I have only three left. I love the marketing too. Only three left is pretty yeah. good marketing. But, but how accurate do you have to be and how confident do you need to be? I would imagine doing an RFID scan once a month is probably not sufficient for being able right. to expose that level of inventory. Is that a true statement? Yeah, it is. And it also has to do with what data you're getting on the gazautas, right? You got the gazinas at receiving, you got the what you have is and what your gazautas are, right? Mm -hmm. And if you set up your system, our experience is if you set up your system so that you've got those three gates, then then you can be pretty darn close to real time without having to do cycle counts every day. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, you could be within a couple percentage points. And so, you know, as we saw in the late 2000s, the knobs people turn as to what their safety stock is, 
before they commit to an order. Uh, clearly, that's gone down with customers that are using item level RFID. Yep. Um, you know, I remember the days when Macy's would talk about a five to one and how they were able to drop that. And I think what we're seeing now is we're seeing um, you're down to selling the last unit um, in a lot of customers, especially if they've got a strong replenishment model back into the store. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. Very, very helpful. So one big question for me, um, as long as I've been involved with this, RFID has always been considered an apparel solution. We're now seeing major retailers that are going outside the whole apparel bubble. They're going yeah. into electronics, automotive, sporting goods, home, et cetera. Um, do, do you think that technology works for those categories, number one? And what do you think some of the other category expansions potentially could be? Yeah, I mean, you know, this, this, I do believe it is because we're seeing examples of it. One, the apparel companies that also have home goods and fragrance and cosmetics don't want to have two different ways of looking at inventory. So while, the, while the, the ability to put tags on things that are harder to tag might be a little bit more expensive, it's a lot more expensive to say that all my apparel and footwear is accurate, but I'm still back in the dinosaur days of counting things manually for those other categories. And so that what we're seeing is they're making the step to say, let's just tag everything. And so what's happening is, is that's pulling through much like what Walmart's done, right? I mean, Walmart is, is using the technology and apparel and then basically expanding that into their categories. And we're seeing the same thing. I, I think there's another component to this, which is there's a misnomer that, that you have to find categories that are expensive or have a high margin. And, um, I think people are not looking at the ROI when they do that. They're just looking at what the cost of goods sold increase is versus what the return on it, what the return is. And so, you know, we've got retailers that are selling things that are less than $10 and finding an ROI mm -hmm. um, with something with, with a tag. And we find other retailers are selling $300 items or, th or a thousand dollar cell phones mm -hmm. and seeing that. And so I think the other thing I would mention is around the tags is that, is that a lot of those other categories are harder to tag. Um, and so as many of us know, there is foil now. Foil is, is attractive for us as consumers. And a lot of product, a lot more than just Chanel number no. five boxes have foil on them anymore. And electronics has it, as well as does clearly fragrance, cosmetics, and um, actually some home goods. So, um, you know, uh, anyway. So anyway, I think, I think it's exciting to see it, but it, the, the, the ROI is where the focus should be, not on uh, the cost of goods sold, really. So I get this question all the time. Does, do you see a day where a great big mass merchandiser like a Walmart or a Target or a Meyer or even Kroger would go 100% RFID all products and eventually be able to do um, basically automated checkout process? Because that's the question people always ask, well, if it works yeah. for these things, why well, wouldn't it work for everything? Do you see that day? I think it's going to be a challenge, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I just think there's, you know, you can't put a tag on a bag of potato chips because the bag of potato chips is basically a foil bag. Yep. Okay. And, um, in, you know, and then the other thing is, as was mentioned, is that if I don't find the right can of green beans, I'm just going to pick the one next. So the whole ROI model's off. It has to be a different ROI. And the real question is, it's going to come down to really smart people looking and saying, is it more, is it more expensive for me to hire people to check out or more expensive for me to figure out how to tag all this stuff mm -hmm. that's there? And I think so far the model has been to um, segregate inventory. And I think general merchandisers will have a bigger challenge. I mean, we've got We've got two general merchandisers as customers, and while they're looking at expanding, they're doing similar to what Walmart's doing, and that is finding categories where it makes sense. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. Matt, I, I see you asking questions. Do we have any questions for, for Dean? I've not seen any questions uh, come in, but I'll, I'll say the same thing that I put in the chat. If you've got questions, just click the raise your hand button and you can uh, have an opportunity to ask that live. Or if you want to ask the question anonymously, anonymously just use the Q&A button and I'll, uh, and I'll read them when the time comes. Awesome. Awesome. 
Dean, thank you very much. Uh, uh-huh. I know you got a wedding to get to. You're more than welcome to stay, but I also want to be respective of family obligations because I know we right. spent all, all week in uh, meetings. So uh, go spend time with your family. So thanks right. for your time. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. Nice to meet you. Be on the panel. Thank you. Appreciate you. All right. Uh, so we got a couple of other folks who are, who are now going to join us. Cause, so we've, we've heard a little bit from Dean around the value proposition for buy online, pick up in store, for inventory accuracy, et cetera. I've got Randy Dunn. And Randy, I don't know if you're with Sensormatic, JCI. I don't even know what to call you anymore, but Randy's Stop a- Stop it. Stop it, Mike. Um, I, I don't. I'm not, I wasn't being well, a smart and, like, I really and just and don't know. It turns know. out we're for sale again, so. <laughs> oh, <God>. oh, goodness. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, Donnie Williams has got all his money. He says he's making all his big bucks as a university. Maybe you could be the Donnie Williams company. What do you uh-huh. think, Donnie? You like yeah, that? I don't know I about like that. It. <laughs> and it just kind of flow off your tongue, though, the Donnie Williams company. I think that's I think it's possible. But anyway, Randy's been doing this. Uh, gosh, get, get, I don't even know. How long have you been doing this, Randy? Uh, so I started in retail in Feb 2004, but I was the Homeland Security guy at ADT. And we got a grant from the brand new Department of Homeland Security to do a secure supply chain program with Boeing and Parsons Engineering and Iridium. And we stumbled on RFID as a content assurance technology in 2001, two and three. So I've been doing this a long time. Wow. Wow. So so as a company, and then we'll, I'm going to let Myron introduce himself here in a second. As a company, your focus has been probably more on the asset protection part of the business. Is that a fair assessment versus the yeah, RFID yeah. or have you done a little bit of both? Well, so I think, you know, Sensematic's got really three prompts. The, the one that we're most well known for is asset protection mm-hmm. and asset protection with video systems and electronic article surveillance. Um, about seven or eight years ago, we bought up a lot of the shopper analytics companies and so shopper track and footfall we you know blended them together and doing the work around um shopper to associate ratio and how do you think about traffic in your stores and then you know the thing that i have led since 2004 which is really we don't call it rfid we call it inventory intelligence right mm-hmm. how do you bring intelligence to a retailer's inventory and how do you do that on an outcome-based way so we're you know more of a solution provider a lot mm-hmm. of great but by the way, Dean killed it, right? He got all the value right on that. And you're going to hear from some folks later today on parts and pieces. But, you know, our job at Sensomatic is basically to stitch together and make sure you get an outcome. Awesome. Awesome. Mr. Burke and I have been working together since about 2003 when I was with Procter & Gamble in Walmart and Procter & Gamble sort of started partnering with a guy by the name of Tom Coughlin, who was, the, I think, the COO at the time, and our senior leadership on this thing called RFID. And uh, Myron and I worked together. Myron was the customer and I was the supplier. I can tell you we didn't always agree. We debated lots of stuff, and I think that was a good thing. And under the spirit of if you can't beat them, join them, I joined Walmart in 2010 and got to, had the honor of working with Myron for Myron and with Myron as we rolled out the item level initiative for uh, for Walmart. So he's a he's a, an incredible resource for us. So Myron, what are you working on today? I believe you're you're also working with some solution providers and folks on new technology and capability for the retail industry, correct? Yeah, thanks, Mike. And and there's there's some good memories in those snippets you were given out there. You forget about some of the things over 25 year retail career. But um, yeah, I spent 25 years with Walmart, uh, about five of that in field operations, the next 20 in really emerging technology before there were emerging technology teams. Um, you know, we had ops coordinators and then the first innovation team and then spent some time in Japan and then ultimately leading what's now store eight uh, on emerging tech. Uh, left Walmart in the summer of 2019, uh, took some time off and uh, actually at the request of the network of folks that I've worked with, uh, was able to start my own uh, technology advisory company, which is really working more with end users, solution providers and startups to help build a smarter solution for the retailer before they get there and help them to think like a retailer thinks about how they run their business and the cost management cycles. Um, and in some cases, 
looking at, I think Dean did a really good job of talking about sort of, you know, this inventory accuracy and OSA as you set it up being this sort of stake in the ground for the value of RFID. That's the winning use case for a launch pad. But I still have this really powerful sensor on these items that can tell me all types of other things that people haven't thought about yet. Um, and part of it's the data flows, part of it's the minutia of just generating capital to, to fund other insights and things. Uh, but there's a tremendous opportunity behind this technology. And then when you put that, <clears throat> excuse me, in, into a collaborative environment and make it interoperable with other technologies such as uh, serialized G10s that are human readable from a, a GS1, G10 perspective um, and matching that um, case tagging, looking at computer vision opportunities and starting to stitch these insights together. There's a lot of things where algorithms can take a, a bigger role at the edge and, and I don't have to move all that upstream in real time. So I'm spending time across that portfolio. I've done some work with autonomous robots and shelf scanning things. I'm doing a lot of work with computer vision uh, and some of the AI ML structures behind that. Uh, I'm still involved with RFID. I'm just not sitting on a retailer uh, chair. Uh, in that, um, that's um, it's interesting, it's different, but it's uh, rewarding because my lens is different and we can have some really good debates about how things should go forward. Uh, so yeah. it's a lot of fun. Perfect, perfect. So for both of you guys, open-ended question. You heard Dean do a really good job of laying out what are the practical use cases of why people get involved with this in the first place. In the first place, inventory accuracy, buy online, pick up in store, those are the driving factors that are getting people there. We've talked about for years other use cases beyond just those. Those are sort of jacks to enter. That's why people start. Let's talk specifically, Randy, from your expertise perspective about the asset protection. Maybe give us a sight into how does asset protection work today? Uh, how exactly does an EAS tag, for example, work? And what's the future use case for uh, potentially something like RFID? Yeah, and, and it's really interesting. And it's a really hot topic in the industry right now. Um, you know, historically, um, the asset protection world was a deterrence world, right? Lock it up, make it difficult to take, and sound an alarm if you left without paying for it, right? It was all left of the event, right? The, once somebody got through the front door of the store, they were gone and there wasn't a lot of information and there wasn't a lot you could do with that. As we've worked with, you know, a number of our customers around what we're calling next generation loss prevention, right? It, you don't have to be a political scientist to know that shrink is an all time high, crime is on the rise. It's become a board level issue. How do you build an intelligence-led program around asset protection that has less to do with alerts and alarms and more about integrated data packages that can be handed off to you know, first responders, law enforcement, or investigators in order to go do a job around taking down these crime rings, recovering the merchandise, and maybe even you know, using RFID to authenticate products. So, there is an enormous, enormous amount of value that comes out of RFID, but as Dean signaled, I have yet to meet a retailer that bought RFID to solve that problem, right? The, the, one of the most amazing things and part of the intoxication of RFID, you get started with it and the single hardest thing is to get tags on stuff. But once you get tags on stuff, right? Macy started with, you know, frozen out of stocks, then they went to display compliance, then they went to pick the last unit, then they went to on-shelf availability, then they went to smart exit, then they went to financial inventory by, you know, doing some sock compliance. And, you know, everybody's played with the smart fitting room and the magic mirror. There are so many things that you can do with RFID, asset protection being a really hot topic right now. But I have yet, Myron, I would, you know, I'm going to ask you this because, It'll be interesting to hear your answer. I have yet to meet a customer that bought RFID. They bought a job to be done and were blown away by the leverage of RFID as a technology to continue to solve problems and do more jobs. Is that is that a fair statement or am I mischaracterizing things? 
No, no, I think I think you've got it right, Randy. And and I sort of boil it down to as retail, when we look at innovation and how we put capital assets into a business, we're we're in essence buying efficiency. Um, and that efficiency has a customer component to it, but it's how do I buy efficiency to get the right product to the right place to have it available for the customer. So when the customer comes in, they're happy. And so I'm trying to get efficient efficiency and customer satisfactions to connect in all of the mathematical equations that we do in retail business use cases. Um, and, and sometimes they don't connect holistically. And I think buy online, pick up in store or buy online delivery is a little bit of example of where, hey, there's a bit of a margin disconnect in that one, but man, the customer demand and the pandemic requirements made that an essential thing. And now as we loosen back up and people go back into stores, I think you see retailers, especially if you read the, the, this month's releases, you know, they're kind of struggling with like, hey, how do I balance this? And they've seen the pain of out of stocks and lack of fulfilling orders and how fast customers can move with a digital phone in their hands to buy somewhere else or get a replacement. And so now they're figuring out, wait, there's a, there's a market share component here and a customer loyalty that I got to figure out. What items matter to those customers to keep them or lose them? What customers matter in the life cycle journey of a customer? Um, and, and, and how much will they spend with me over a lifetime? And I've got to start to satisfy those things. And so we're getting infinitely more data. But to Dean's point, our systems need more bolt-on modules because the parent systems aren't designed to run in real time. So we've got to add on modules that can support that real-time data where it matters. We, we can't do it all for the sake of doing it. We can't do tech for tech's sake. We can't do data for data's sake. But it is an efficiency for the sake of the customer uh, yeah. and that relationship at the end of the day. Cool. Hey, uh, one quick question, um, a, a little bit with Dean and a little bit with you guys, but Derek has Derek Johnson from InViews just asked a question. Uh, any other technical challenges with deploying RFID in the scanning process? Can a scanner pick up and count items on other aisles behind the scanner? Is that automatically resolved in the system or does it create a counting issue? Um, you want to talk a little bit about how either one of you guys want to take how that works and how RFID does count tags multiple times, but it isolates the, the number of unique tags. My, Myron, maybe you start with the traditional model on cycle counting and where you think this is going. And then, you know, Mike asked me about fixed infrastructure and how we're doing asset protection. There are some challenges there. So maybe you start and I'll yeah. clean up. No, I think it's, I think it's a good lead in, uh, Randy. And uh, I think to the question, Mike, um, yes, RFID will count things more than once. It will count things outside of where I'm pointing the device. It's not like a scan gun where I'm looking at line of sight only, sort of a laser beam or a photograph type view. Uh, it's a much broad spectrum. We, we've sort of described it over the years as a, a read envelope that's like an amoeba. And that amoeba changes as I get in the presence of metal. It gets reflected a little bit or somebody walks down the aisle and the water in my body causes it to bend around. So I'll read something I wasn't reading while ago. But there's firmware and filter values within the structure and the software platform that start to say, oh, I'm only looking for items. So any case tags I read, I can filter out very easily. Uh, and then I can start to do modular compressions that say I'm only looking for G10s that fit into this subcategory group or this modular section. So when you see stores with category, subcategory, uh, and then modular section, aisle section location, you're able to start to match that data and pare it down and say, what am I seeing here? So in the reader, I can actually filter off hundreds of thousands of reads that I captured. I don't necessarily want to throw them away. I just don't want them for this specific investigation or set of analytics that I'm doing. So I think the technology has advanced very, very well in, in the ability to do that. Uh, and I think it's continuing to advance uh, with, with more interoperability and standards coming forward in that space. So I think with a handheld, you're able to start to decipher this really well um, and, and really target what you're looking for. And because there's a time date stamp with each event, so each cycle count with a handheld would have a user ID and an event. There's a time and date stamp with every read. And so you have an immense amount of metadata to drill down into this space. You can even look at how long someone spent doing the cycle count and the algorithms of what's my expected inventory versus what did I get? And if I'm more than 30% off, I'm going to say, you know what? I don't believe Bobby did his job. I'm going to have somebody else do it. 
Um, and I think that's a really good launch point because it's helping us bridge the gap between real time and batch processes in a manageable way. It's delivering business value to entities today at the customer touch point. Yep. Uh, most of these are customer facing at the store. So the end point of the supply chain, as we think of it, some are midpoints of the supply chain. If I've got a consolidator or a ship from warehouse and, and a big Amazon model or something like that, or even a third party consolidator. Um, what I think is really interesting, and I know Randy and them have done extended work in this, because w when I think of AP, an exit's an exit. I don't care what facility it's in, something left. And it either left because it was supposed to, or it left and it wasn't supposed to, meaning I have a transaction confirming it or I don't. Right. And so I think as, as you think about extending the use cases of RFID, once I get the tag on its source, now I can start to say, hey, my store inventory and my OSA is getting pretty good. What can I do next? Well, can I leverage a bunch of, I don't know how many thousands of exit doors or any of them have access to, can I leverage that and start to look at a shrink piece? And I won't steal his thunder on that. Well, if I can do it there, can I do an inbound door and measure what came in? And now I'm seeing what came into the store and what went out of the store. And then I could say, well, I can do the exit at the DC and then the entrance at the DC. And suddenly I can create a nodal theory or, or one we've referred to in the industry as choke point. I can see what came in the DC and what left the DC versus what was supposed to come in and what was supposed to leave. What went into transportation out of the DC and into a store and start to get a metric on each of these nodes and the same thing at the store. And then I can look at which node has the worst performance, which tells me I have a problem in this node. So I don't have to go solve every stop in the supply chain. I go target the nodes that are giving me issues and I use pilots to find those. And then as I drill down, that starts to give me very valuable secondary use cases to go look at what do I need to solve here? Is it a people problem? Is it a system problem? Is it a transporter problem? Is it a disingenuous associate problem? And, and there's lots of things there. And I think Randy and them have actually created kind of a use case ladder in their um, asset protection model uh, because they look at protecting assets across the supply chain, not just the retail stores. So yep. I'll, I'll, I'll stop there and turn it over to you, Randy. Yeah, well, and I think so. I mean, you know, I could talk about this for hours, but I do think, right, Dean got it exactly right. The way to get started is around on shelf availability, inventory accuracy, and the ability to make promises for shoppers coming to the store to get fulfilled. That is exactly the right way to start. And it's generally what I would call an active scan. You've got a mobile device in the hand of a person, a static tag, you're moving the field, and you are collecting inventory data. And as Myron talked about, you can filter out the third, fourth, fifth, sixth time you read that tag, and you can get really clear information on what do I have and relatively where's it at. It's on the sales floor, it's in the back room. As you start moving to these more advanced use cases where now you're talking about passive reads, we're talking... You know, people call that fixed infrastructure in the RFID space, but fundamentally it's a passive read where I've got a static field and I've got a moving tag. How do I make sense of all that? And, you know, as you think about, you know, the labor challenge that retail's got, you think about the shrink problem, you think about some of what you talked about earlier, Mike, which is, you know, is it good enough to know uh, once a week or once a month with the cycle count, getting much more dynamic with updating my data and using this passive capability, yeah. the physics problems and the question that we got, which is, you know, do you have problems and do you need filters and do you need firmware and do you need smart software to figure all that out? The answer is yes. And that's why we recommend people start where Dean suggested, which is, Start with active scans, but the unbelievable ability to walk the use case ladder and go from inventory availability, on shelf availability, to loss prevention and authentication and ORC recovery, that all starts to happen because you've got <clears throat> passive scanning, which is fixed readers, and that's a much different physics problem. Yeah, and and I think the one thing, and we're gonna we're gonna wrap this part up and move to the next piece of this. One of the things that I think is really really important for people to understand, 
RFID stands for radio frequency identification. The RF is how do I talk to that particular item? The identification is not only have I got a UPC, but I actually have a serialized unique number for every selling unit. Kind of like the VIN number of your car. I got two cars that are sitting right next to each other. They're the exact same model, exact same features. Everything's the same. What differentiates the two is the VIN number. So uh, Ursula asked a question for a practical application in a food retailer environment. I'll give you one. Here's two bottles. They have the exact same UPC. Guess what? I now know that this one is one of two and this one is two of two. Well, so what? Why is that important? Because one of the applications in the food space is for freshness of product, bakery items, um, packaged meat, etc. I know exactly when that product came into my store. Therefore, I can actually say how long, how many days has it been there? There are three packages of meat that need to be date encoded to mark down. Uh, Walmart calls it CVP to sell it or otherwise we'll have to throw it away. So because I have unique intelligence at every selling unit, not just at the UPC level, I think that's one of the, that's how RFID, when you do a scan, it goes, how many tags did I read, but how many unique tags did I read? That's how it differentiates. So I think the ability for it to do that, including one of our favorite topics, and, and Myron and I are going to have a podcast on this sooner or later. Even if I have three television sets and my on hand is 100% perfect, 100% perfect, I may not have three televisions to sell you. Why? Because one of them may be on a wall as a display for customers. The other one just got returned by a customer because they said it didn't work. So it's sitting back in claims being evaluated to see if it really works. I really only have one customer, one to sell you, right? So starting to be able to call, as Myron call it, and I call it PI states, where a, is it a selling unit or not based upon where it is, is another use case. So let's kind of transition off the use cases. We can follow up later if you have any additional questions. I think people are also saying, okay, well, this is cool. Well, how in the world do I get started? How do I do this? Uh, so I am going to put Mark on the line here. Mark, uh, t tell us a little bit. We got three people who are going to help us with this. Uh, one is going to be, how do I select a tag? That'll be Mark. How do I select a software solution or do I build it or do I buy it? Whatever. We'll have Randy do that again. And then Eric is going to walk us through, Hey, I think there's a hardware component to this as well. How does that work? So Mark, give us some update on, you know, okay, you, you happen to give us a little bit of introduction to who you are, uh, but also tell us a little bit about how do I decide what tags to actually purchase? Sure. Um, thanks, Mike. And uh, pleasure to meet everyone and be part of the group. Um, a little bit of background, I've been in this particular space for about 22 years in branded packaging and not just RFID, but where branded packaging meets variable, infor, uh, variable information, which is barcoding, which kind of leads into how we're utilizing RFID now. So um, quite a bit of experience. And in the last, as we all know, in the last three, four years with Walmart ramping back up, the, um, the need for picking the right tag in the supplier community who this is all relatively new with has really turned into a lot of daily conversations, which uh, just happens nonstop and with the expansion categories more and more and more. So from, so let's kind of segue into tag selection. So I think ARC has made it easy for our space when you're dealing with how they approve the inlays for the particular use cases in item level retail. So typically that's driven by a department or a category that they know that they service. So we reference the ARC approval and that gives us basically the, the list of inlays that are approved and the particular form factor that that inlay, basically that's the size that you have to work with. So we select the correct inlay option based on the performance parameters that Auburn has approved and we know what size we're working that we're working with. There's some retailers that don't use Auburn, but we, so we already have a pre-approved list. So same, same, thing, same thing basically happened. So now we know the size of the form factor. That then equates to the size of the tag or the label that we can put this product into. So we, and then the next step that happens is we review the current packaging and the, per, the current barcoding details that goes onto that product. Because the ideal scenario here is to incorporate that RFID 
into the current packaging that carries the, the barcoded information with it. That's the ideal scenario. So what you do then is, and you kind of look at, and then a, a, a simple decision tree has been, after the last three to four years, your easiest way to integrate is already basically uh, decided for you. If you've got an integrated hang tag, you can easily embed RFID into it. So you're not dealing with too much complexity. What I think you then have to look at is you have to look at the timing to implement. And so let's let's rewind to Walmart three, four months ago. They knew that the implementation was, was going to basically be a, a phase one or a quick compliance. So our discussion with the suppliers um, and, you know, with Walmart being very, very aware of this, the discussion with the suppliers are, how do we RFID enable? We know it's not ideal. We know it's not long-term, but the goal is to hit the MABD and the goal is to hit the in-store day. So we sit down with them and we talk about, typically in that case, use the generic sticker that can carry the, you know, a, the UPC information, whether it's human readable or machine readable, we encode it, it gets put on the product or we put a generic secondary ticket on the product, which again, serves the same purpose. So that, that's basically phase one. Phase two, at the same time, we start discussions with the, with the supplier community, what's the best way to integrate it into current packaging? Because you wanna, not only does it make it easier, but aesthetically, the product, I mean, ultimately the product looks better. You don't have a generic ticket you don't have a generic, you don't have a generic sticker sitting on the product in addition to an existing UPC. The other, the other reason why that's important is you're, you've already incorporated it into the workflow. So you don't have a disruption now by making sure you have to match a secondary item onto the primary packaging. So in theory, you've got the association to the right product um, happening in your existing workflow. I mean, we all know the majority of these goods are outsourced through contractors or in, in, in some cases, you know, brick and mortar owned facilities, but most of them are following the compliance guidelines set in place by, you know, their outsource partners. So this makes their work a lot easier, less disruptive, and ideally it's the most cost efficient way to get the product into the supply chain. So what happens then is we engage the internal and external resources. So uh, what, what happens then is the we have our implementation teams. We work with the customer's implementation teams. Then we make sure that our corporate customer, who is typically the retailer and the brand in this case, we make sure that everything that's happening is in line with the, with the marketing, the look of the product, and uh, the execution of the product. And then I think the most important thing, as important is once you're done, you have to make sure that you have the proper QC checks in place which not just involves proper serialization, um, but also that UPC to EPC match if you're putting a secondary product on the um, on, on your primary package. So that's, awesome. that's, that's basically the tag selection process in a nutshell. Awesome. So I, I've, had, I've had several questions, Mark, and I think you're the right guy to answer this question. I, I've had several questions around RFID tags on foil. We already talked about the challenge of that. There are RFID tags that will work on aluminum and foil, et cetera. How does that work and how expensive are they compared to a regular tag? Well, if you're gonna put it direct on the product, spacing is probably the most, the most critical part. So you wanna create a little bit of buffer. Um, and I think Auburn is fantastic for that also. So if um, uh, if you can create the spacing, I know we typically, I think they typically ask for two to three inches. There's a couple different ways you can create spacing. Um, you can do a bit of a flag or a little bit of a, a rat tail, which gives you the distance from the product, whether it's on the metal or not. Um, but I think ideally you want to get your product down to Auburn. Uh, you can design something that creates that spacing but it should go down to the lab to make sure that it still reads according to the performance parameters that is required of the product. Yep. Yeah, um, so, can, well, I'm, I'm sorry, sorry right. like, one more thing. So foil also, you, you know, just because there's foil on your packaging doesn't mean that's gonna disrupt your RFID readability either. So there are, we, 
There are tags in the retail environment that have foil on them. You either position the embedding of your inlay far enough away, or you cut down on your foil so that it is not dense and disrupting the, the readability of the product. Perfect, perfect. So one more quick question that, that I that I wanted to make sure that we cover here is this question here, Mark, and I think you're the right person to ask this. So I can I can buy RFID blank tags from companies like yours and others. Uh, as Dean Fru, I know, makes them available. Avery Dennison makes them available. I can buy those tags and then print and encode those tags by myself, which Eric, you'll talk a little bit about some of the hardware to be able to do that. Or I can buy pre-encoded tags. Give me the pluses and minuses from a, just give me the broad tags and let me print them versus you just encode them and I just apply them to the product, that source. Yeah, sure. So um, it, it's actually coming up a lot in some of the discussions with the supplier community now. And what I, what we like to tell everybody is, Let's, you know, owning it yourself takes time and it takes resources. Mm -hmm. Let's let's get you compliant through a service bureau. You're learning it right now. A lot of these suppliers are learning about RFID for the very first time. Don't try to own it right now. T you know, leave it up to us. Leave it up to a service bureau provider mm -hmm. who has been serializing for years and can get you product that's compliant. Then start the discussions on the, in on the implant printing and owning it yourself. And if you don't understand the IT aspect of it, um, and, and I know there's a belief that sometimes it's less expensive, but you have to look at the total cost of ownership. You have to look at the resources that you're going to dedicate. Um, and you know whether it's easier or less expensive, I think you just have to put a pencil to it yourself. Some companies have been doing it for years. You know, There's some big brands out there with um, strong IT teams, who probably date back to 2009, 2010. They've been doing it for years and I, and I think they do it well. So I'm not going to discount it, but if, if it's new to you and you're trying to hit some deadlines, table it for a further discussion when you can really understand what's involved with it. I think the risk of duplication. And, and then the other thing you have is you've got the hybrid model now, meaning you may do some of it offshore you may do some of it in-house. You have to be careful that you're serializing with a strategy so that if you've got a UPC that's actually being tagged in same UPC multiple locations, how are you guaranteeing there's no duplication versus what you're doing and what a service bureau provider is doing? Yep. So it's, you know, I guess you could throw those things on a scale, but that's that's kind of my initial feedback on it. Perfect, perfect. All right. Thank you very much, Mark. Very, very helpful. Um, so, so let's talk a little bit about software. Obviously, software is part of this as well. Randy, we're going to put you back up on the spot. Um, and, and the questions that I heard is, is a couple things. And I tried to break them down into a couple of different categories that, that I've heard. Number one, considerations in terms of bill versus buy, what should it do, hardware requirements, et cetera. And then secondly, what is the base entry of what your software should do, whether you build it or buy it? Help somebody who's relatively new to this space think through the build or buy questions and then specifically what the, heart, what, what the actual software should do. Got it. Got it. So here, so I've got this, you know, I got the four C's of RFID. You got to create the data. And Mark just talked about that. If you don't do that well, all the rest of it doesn't matter. You got to mm -hmm. capture the data. And I think Eric's going to talk about that. And that's use case dependent, right? Do you want to do it actively, passively? Where do you want to do it? The, the last two C's are you got to consume the data and then you've got to capitalize on the data to drive it back into business outcomes. And it's in those last two items that the software plays. And so, you know, what I would say is there've been a lot of folks that have been very successful building their own software packages for what I would call active or basic cycle counting and inventory. And, you know, that's gonna be about IT availability. It's gonna be about, you know, um, you know, are you trying to protect, you know, your payroll, uh, which by the way, Retail's a tech business, so building your own is not a bad strategy. There are a lot of good software folks out there. Dean's got a really nice package. I think Sensomatic does a pretty good job at that. So, you know, build versus buy, I think is as much around a resource and capability question 
as it is about an RFID question when you're talking about just cycle counting. As you move up the use case ladder and start to do more sophisticated things and realize that the decision logic and the, the firmware and the physics of the software and you know how do you deal with you know tags in the environment, building your own software gets a little tricky. So as you move from basic cycle counting to some of these passive scanning, then I think, you know, we're seeing a lot of folks say we can't do this and we really need a Dean Fru or Randy Dunn or somebody else in the market to come out and help us figure that out. So I think, you know, that's that's kind of how I would, you know, frame the build versus buy um, out front. What what I want to talk about. Can and I I want to time. Randy, can I interrupt you real quick? Yeah, let, yeah. Let, here's one of the things that I would say. Yeah. Have your information technology company or your team focus on the value proposition behind the firewall and not how well can I print and code a tag or read a tag. There's no value proposition. And these guys have been running Zebra and Sensormatic and SML. They know how to encode product and they know how to scan product. They know how to do find it functions. Don't build that yourself. Your competitive no, advantage is behind the firewall. No IT department is still writing printer drivers. Want to bet? <laughs> well, I bet you they, lunch they that you're wrong. <laughs> they, they should be building. I agree. A hundred percent. I think you got it, Mike. And I, I want to leave time because I know we're getting late and I've had, yep. um, you know, I've had my fair share of time. I want Eric to get his, but this is a big conversation, but I think, right. Starting out, you can build your own as you get to the finish line. There's no way people can build their own and starting with, right. If I'm going to cycle count, you got to be able to print and code the tags uh, yep. to March point. Otherwise, you got nothing. Um, and then how do you, what kinds of feedback loops and what kinds of workflows do you want to support? And are you better off with a third party? Or are you better off with your own? Those are all really uh, personal questions, retailer by retailer. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, we do need to move on to Eric because I've actually got Eric and Ryan both uh, to cover this. Okay. So we'll make it Eric, quick. Keep it Talk simple. Talk about hardware. Okay. Well, thanks again for having me, Mike. Um, so, yeah, if you can go to the next slide, if you don't mind. Um, you know, it, it, it's really about, uh, you know, everyone's touched on it so far, uh, the, what, what, what you really need for your business. What's the ROI? And, you know, in, in this chart, we're showing the data capture evolution to where, you know, many of us remember the manual counts. And then, uh, you know, we moved to the barcode solutions, which was revolutionary at the time. And then now we're introduced to manual RFID solutions where, you know, it, it, it was a big plus, uh, you know, you're reading thousands of tags every second versus, you know, scanning your, each individual item, um, which brings us now to the automated RFID solutions. And re really it's about, you know, what is the right thing for your business? Um, in, in a lot of business, uh, you know, that the, the manual RFID solution is still a great solution. However, the more automated you want to get and, you know, th this really became apparent during the, 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 the COVID issues um, where we didn't have the employees. And like Dean mentioned, I, I love that analogy where, you know, now everyone's forced into the pool. And so now what do I do? And so that, 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 that's really where a lot of the automated solutions really came into play. And so in, in, in the screen, I'm not sure if you, if you can see it very well, but we have like an overhead reader, uh, you know, we call smart lens. And then we also have uh, RFID on robots. And then we also have doctor portals. And, you know, really it goes back to, um, what Myron mentioned, where, where do you want to create that that portal or, 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 or that checkpoint to, to validate that, okay, this pallet shipped from the DC, uh, it made it on the truck, I, I, I validate that I have this many items on, on that pallet, uh, it made it to the store, I can validate that, you know, I, that, that, that it was received at the store, and then is it in the back room or is it on the sales floor? And, you know, how much do I still have back there? And so really it just depends on, you know, what, what you're looking for in, in, in that solution. And so again, you know, we can overcomplicate this. We, we, there's a lot of great discussion here, but I think sometimes it's like drinking from a fire hose. And really the, the best way I've seen about going about it is just keeping it very simple. Um, and, and, and typically most of our customers start off with handheld uh, RFID scans and then build upon it there and say, um, you know, like, like I, I would like more visibility to my either my DC or my back room or from the back room to the sales floors or, you know, that uh, asset protection piece, uh, you know, like 
because wh where, where you have uh, uh, handheld scans, you're going to, you know, uh, you're going to get that inventory very accurately as you perform those checks. But between the checks, and, and I think, uh, you know, like Dean mentioned, what, it could be a week, it could be a month, it could be a day, but having that more automated um, infrastructure uh, allows you to track those items, uh, you know, and specifically with, with asset protection there. And, and I know we're short on time. I'll go into the point, but we, 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 I'll make one example of we're working with a customer now to where they are um, uh, marrying up their uh, 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 cameras, their, their, their digital cameras with the RFID solution. And so they're able to see shoplifters as they go through the store. And oh, I, by the way, there's a blind spot that, you know, that, 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 that their inventory or, or, or their merchandise is stuck in um, or, or, or is being placed in. And then that, that, that they wait for everyone to kind of get busy. Then they just kind of push it out the door. And the more visibility you, you can add to those type of events, the more the retailer is able to you know, combat that and maybe put something different in that area instead of creating a blind zone. Just Perfect. an example. Perfect. 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 All right. Thank you very much. Sorry, we're we're uh, we we are re running a little bit tight on time, but but Eric, that was extremely helpful. Thank you. No so so interesting. Ursula just uh, sent us a chat. Can you explain where the where is the tag applied in the supply chain? Which is a great setup question for exactly what the next topic is. Uh, before we do that, I want to introduce Ryan Cochran. Ryan is with Anderson Merchandising. Uh, Ryan has uh, has been around for a long time. And uh, Ryan was very actively involved with a particular retailer that I was working with on implementing RFID uh, in the apparel space. Um, and his primary focus was tagging both at store and at source. So let me, let me do a couple of setup things and then I'm gonna turn it over to Ryan. So the question becomes, where should you tag? And, and I think the, the obvious answer that everybody would say is the best place to do it is at source. So you see a picture over here of a Goodyear tire plant. Those tires are being manufactured. I think they're actually race car tires, so that's probably not applicable for a tag. But tires coming off the line, as soon as they're off the line, you would actually put a tag on them, which has an embedded RFID tag. It has an EPC symbol right here, which tells both retailers and customers that it is an RFID enabled product. It has the UPC, which is scannable and it has a barcode that is scannable. Uh, so you can see the serialized information in it, but that is probably the best place because two things, number one, you actually apply the tag as soon as the product is available to sale. Secondly, then it can be used throughout the entire supply chain. Okay. If you don't catch it there, that becomes more problematic to make sure you did it right. So at the distribution center, people sometimes do tagging at the DC. Uh, and in some cases, you can see this back room is pretty crowded, but can you imagine having to op open up every box and ta RFID tagging at the store level? I'm gonna introduce uh, Ryan. Ryan, I know you guys did this at the store level, and I think you've actually talked to us a few people about doing it at the DC level. What all is involved with a third party like Anderson going in and actually tagging up for a supplier or for a retailer? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Mike. Uh, appreciate you letting me uh, join the panel and, and having this conversation with everybody. Um, so what we've seen, you know, when it comes to a retailer, we've seen different retailers use different mat methods of tag up. Um, you know, there's there's all different types of ways you can tag up in the store. But uh, I'm going to talk through kind of one of the most uh, most common ways. So the first thing uh, that you got to do is we, we talked a lot about equipment today, right? So there's there's multiple different types of equipment out there, but you know you got to make sure that your equipment um, is ready to go, right? Is your battery charged? Do you have connectivity? Is your firmware accurate? Um, all those different types of uh, all those different types of components. Um, then the way that it works is is on your items that are in stores or at your distribution center that are not tagged at the source, which what Mike was talking about. Um, is, you know, essentially you're, you're going through a manual process of checking each uh, item specifically. And what you're looking for is the EPC, which Mike has up on the, up on the um, uh, screen here. So uh, when the teams are in stores, they're looking at every item that uh, is applicable for RFID. Um, and what they'll do is, is they'll look for the EPC. If they find the EPC, which is circled here, they'll move on to the next product. Uh, there's no action needed and they go through. Uh, if there is a product that does not not have the EPC um, as, as specific to this gene, then what they would do is they 
would um, they would go through. Oh, excuse me. That that is a that is an RFID. But if there isn't one, what they would do is, is they would scan the barcode. It would then print uh, and encode the RFID tag, uh, and then the team member would then place uh, the item on the uh, actual physical product. Awesome. Next slide, Mike. So what could go wrong, right? So, uh, you know, we always want to talk about the, the processes of, of what vision of good is, but there are things that can go wrong that are uh, very important to know, right? So first and foremost, if there's no tag ever placed on the item or if it's missed, uh, that's that's obviously an issue, uh, especially when you're thinking about trying to take care of the customer uh, and have an accurate on hand. So uh, we could uh, you, you could tag the wrong, pro uh, wrong product. So maybe you scan a UPC of an item nearby and you print off the... Uh, RFID label and place an RFID on the wrong product, uh, then you're going to have an inaccurate on hands uh, across the board. Um, or uh, the third example on this, uh, what could go wrong is, is having a double tag. So as, as you're looking through, if it already has the EPC label and for some reason that item gets scanned or if it had a printed tag and the team places another one, again, now your inventory is going to um, be off. Uh, you know, it'll double count that specific item, which at the end of, end of the day creates a uh, tough uh, tough experience for the for the shopper awesome um, the only other thing I'll take tell you is there is a whole set of standards that we will not get into of how to encode a tag and how to place an item on a tag. I, I will, I'll point you to GS1, which is the, basically the standards organization for that work. Uh, but, but basically, they will lot, walk you through how do you encode a tag if you choose to do it yourself, which is what we strongly recommend that you don't do, at least to start out with, uh, and or where to place it on the product. All right. Thank you, Ryan. Appreciate that. Um, yeah, let thanks, me do, let me do a kind of quick wrap up. We're, we're a couple, couple minutes over, but we kind of uh, start a couple minutes late. Uh, first and foremost, thank you so much to all the panelists. Uh, you guys did a great job, and th thank you for your expert advice and your partnership over the years. I think it was really helpful to uh, the participants. Um, we will make this particular video and the deck available to you via soft copy for those of you who have been asking us if that would be feasible. And the only other thing I would ask you is, again, thank you for both uh, the Walton College as well as Conversations on Retail. Uh, please join via LinkedIn. Everybody except Randy Dunn. Everybody join in LinkedIn. I know I couldn't stand. I couldn't help you, Randy. Um, join LinkedIn and uh, follow these uh, particular organizations. They're doing a great job for service to the industry, and we'd love to have you guys involved. And we do have several of these video podcasts that are going to be coming out uh, literally once a month or so.